The second city debate was held on February 3rd, 2016, at UBC Robson Square. In this one, the topic was whether we should be building fewer towers in Vancouver. The Sala Urban Narium City Debate Series was conceived as one more way to foster a robust culture of informed and uncensored debate around development principles that impact not only specific projects and neighborhoods, but our cities and our region as a whole. Good evening. I'm here tonight to argue for the motion that we should build fewer residential towers in Vancouver. But just to be clear, the resolution we're debating tonight is not to build no more towers, but rather to build fewer towers. Of course, towers are part of the housing mix that we need, and they're not going to disappear anytime soon. So let's just agree that towers will remain, but there are many other forms of housing that we should be focusing on, and which Vancouver has very little or none of. Historically, Vancouver has done two housing typologies very well. Single family detached houses, and high-rise towers, with very little in between these two extremes. But it's way past time to expand this extremely limited housing menu and to address both our housing deficit crisis and our sustainability goals and save us from the sterile tower, tower town that Vancouver is rapidly becoming. So why build fewer towers? What's wrong with towers? Well, the answer is many things. Consider the following. The high-rise tower form is very inflexible Towers are reliant on complex and expensive systems, which makes them particularly vulnerable to future shock, such as climate change, changing demographics, earthquakes, windstorms, etc. Towers can't be easily adapted, altered, or added to. They don't allow for organic change over time, like other forms of housing do. They have built-in obsolescence. High-rise towers reduce housing to a commodity, controlled by the development industry. Towers encourage speculative development. <laughs> towers are a vehicle for parking global capital and result in empty condos. Towers have many hidden costs, such as the added costs of underground parking, elevators, complex mechanical systems, and embedded energy costs from the extensive use of concrete, exterior wall heat loss, etc. Towers are essentially vertical gated housing, and this does not build community. There are high social costs of living in these vertically gated facilities. They perpetuate social inequality, socioeconomic uniformity, and decreased social diversity. And by their very scale and height, towers have serious negative impacts on surrounding low-rise neighborhoods, and they're hugely disruptive and out of scale. Towers face much higher resistance from these neighbors, resulting in longer, more costly approvals processes, as my opponent can attest to. Ongoing resentment and loss of trust in local governments. Towers typically don't help build a coherent public realm. Towers represent a particularly ferocious form of gentrification. These large pulses of development often lead to rapid disruption and dislocation of established lower income communities. High rise towers typically offer a very limited range of housing types and sizes. And towers force the strata corporation form of governance on their occupants, which is becoming increasingly problematic here. So basically, I'm arguing that high rise towers are the very definition of an inflexible, unadaptable housing form that furthermore reduces housing to a speculative commodity that is controlled by a small, unaccountable elite. So, what's the alternative to high rise towers? Well, there are many other scalable housing forms that fit better into established residential neighborhoods rather than disrupting them and which deliver effective densification. Consider, for example, the many forms of housing that other cities have mastered over the, over the centuries, such as the block housing of Paris, or Barcelona, or Berlin, the row housing of London, the semi-detached housing and brownstone housing of older East Coast cities, the garden court housing and zero lot line housing of Southern California, the Galleria courtyard housing forms of Spain and South America, cluster housing, triplex, fourplex, duplex, etc., carriage houses, work live housing, co-housing, laneway housing, and so on. <coughs> now, I invite you to consider some of the many benefits of smaller scale incremental housing. This type of housing allows our city to grow more organically and incrementally, rather than in abrupt and disruptive shifts. It better fits into established single-family housing neighborhoods. It is often, therefore, more acceptable to those established neighborhoods and therefore can be quicker to approve, 
and less controversial and confrontational to achieve. It provides more housing choice and diversity, something we sorely need here. And it can also provide more affordable housing options. It reduces speculation and treating housing as a commodity. It's more sustainable in terms of construction materials, which use less carbon, so emit lower greenhouse gases. It optimizes the city's existing infrastructure and street network. It requires less land assembly, so it can be done on much smaller parcels. And when located along transit corridors, it supports transit infrastructure and local businesses and forms a better transition between the high-rise corridors and the adjacent low-rise neighborhoods. And finally, another very key advantage of smaller-scale incremental projects is that they can be done by many more landowners and not just deep-pocketed developers. In other words, more local landowners can initiate and benefit from it. Homeowners could become, quote, developers of their own individual properties and thus spread the economic benefits around which is more economically equitable and builds social sustainability. In conclusion, when you add up all the benefits of smaller scale incremental housing over the many disadvantages of high rise towers, I'm sure you will agree with me and with the motion that we should build fewer towers. Thank you. And the city is changing and uh, the role of professionals, political leaders, and society at large is to manage that change both justly and equitably. Now, he might have been talking about the city, but he might as well have been talking about growth. And I'm going to argue tonight that the most just and equitable way for us to grow as a region is via the power form. And we do this making three points. One, we have to recast our ideas about what growth means for this region. We have to grow at a scale and a pace uh, that we have never seen before, and the tower is the best form. Secondly, we have to be environmentally responsible about when we manage this growth. And the tower form is the most advantaged in terms of environmental impact on both our natural environment and our climate. And finally, the arguments against the tower that my colleague over here has laid out that they are less socially sustainable, uh, promote uh, less well-being and human happiness, are unfounded and absolutely no doubt supports that. And it's actually endemic to both mid-rise forms and tower forms of the line. So, I have to go 100 miles here and let's get started. So, next slide. Let's talk about why we have to grow. Let's start with the national picture. Right now, this is how our workforce ages in Canada. Right now, if we had no more immigration, we would be down about 7.2 million jobs in Canada by 24. Next slide. So, we actually have to add about 13.3 million people to Canada, grow by 30% in order to have our economy grow at all. And I'm an environmentalist, I'm not growth for the growth's sake. This is talking about very modest growth at 0.05%, just enough to keep us out of recession. And this is really important because the provision of social services, uh, hospitals, daycares, our education system, is predicated on us having a growing economy, right? So we have to have growth, this is non-negotiable, in order to have the standard of living that we've become accustomed to. I'm not, again, I'm not talking about MacBook on your, on your living room table or a three-car garage. I'm talking about being able to go to the hospital when you've broken your arm. Next slide. So what does that look like in our region we add 30% to Canada? Well, this is what our population looks like. It's a destination for immigration. Next slide. This is what it's going to look like in 2040. Next animation. So this is what our workforce looks like. That's that 30% that we've added. And that's pretty impressive, right? Those, that's the money we need to keep those social services, keep us happy, keep us alive, prosperous. But what the real change here is the next animation. Next one. Is that we've increased our seniors in the local region by 113% due to aging people baby boomer population away. And so when we think about that, just to keep the same social services we, we have, we have to grow by 30%. But there's going to be even more demand on social services in the future. Next slide. So I would posit that the 1.1 million that we've set as a target for this region should actually be the floor, right? If we want to actually just not get worse off, but just remain the way we are. So we're going to grow by immigration, and we're going to get older. And we need places for these people to live, and we need those places quickly. So how many units do we need? At roughly two people per unit, we need 550,000 units in our region to accommodate just the minimum amount of people. Next slide. So how many people is 500, or how many units is 550,000 units? Well, it's just a little bit more than 549,000 units. But uh, what does it look like? Next slide. It's all of the residential units in Vancouver and UBC. Next slide. 
all of the units in Burnaby, all of the units in New Westminster, all of the units in the city of North Vancouver, all of the units in the district of North Vancouver, and all of the units in West Vancouver. We have to rebuild all of that housing all over again, again, in, 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 in what we already have, in order to accommodate that 1.1 million. That's a lot of density. Next slide. So how do we make sure it happens from an environmental responsible perspective? We've done a lot of research on this. We have built a, an online calculator tool that calculates quantitatively the environmental benefits of different housing choice. Um, it's been reviewed by experts in academia, local governments, and industry uh, for its methodology, and all the, re the, it, the research that feeds it is independent and government produced. Next slide. That's what it looks like. You can check it out online. You can play around with it yourself at HBO. Uh, next slide. And what we've done is we've actually populated, we went to MLS, we gave these guys a fighting chance, we just looked at 15 bog standard towers that were built in the last 20 years, right? These are inefficient buildings we see today. This is their, their statistics in terms of their average size and unit count. Next slide. We took brand new, state-of-the-art, environmentally efficient mid-rise housings to compare them to. Next slide. And this is what we found. In order to accommodate the same amount of people, we needed more than two times the amount of space to, to accommodate people even in mid-rise. Next slide. And we use more energy, and we use more water, and we use more land area to do it, right? So let's actually do a best on best comparison. Next slide. Uh, we take the most dense high rise developments we're building here in Vancouver. Next slide. We compare those against a new development on Candy Street, for example, and we can fit more people in a high rise development so that we actually were consuming less than three times the amount of land to do this. Next slide. When we actually look at the environmental impacts of that, we're saving almost 80 tons of carbon, which not, is not insignificant, 100,000 liters of water, and almost two-thirds of the Canadian football field. Next slide. And so let's not kid ourselves when my colleague talks about, you know, mid-rise development in Barcelona and Berlin, right? This is actually how we build mid-rise development in, in, in the middle of world. Next slide. Bring it in. Next slide. <laughs> You can't tell me that somebody is more socially connected and happier living behind this giant green hedge than they are, say, in the West End. If we look at regional crime statistics, Wall and Newton are our least safe, most crime ridden places, and they're populated with townhouses and mid rise development. And we look at Vancouver, it's high rise, high density, low crime, and high happiness. Thank you very much. Our position is that we can create a lot more options to address future needs in our cities with a lot less towers. It is about your city and your future home. Cities are primarily for people. They are to create communities to collaborate and to work, to invent, to be entrepreneurial, to learn, to prosper, for the enjoyment, for commerce, for which our buildings are supposed to be imaginative and supportive platforms. Next one. To build less towers is not an argument against towers, but to create more diversity and respond to a broader set of needs and desires. Next. We need to shift our focus towards urban livability, affordability, and sustainability all at the same time. Next. Towers can produce fascinating urban sculptures, and they can define our skyline and create the city's postcard's presence. They are also exp uh, expressions of success of our collective ambitions. But sometimes, next slide, that can also backfire. <laughs> next one. Towers have become a seemingly endless sea of formulaic repetitions in the present representation of investment opportunities for global capital. Do they meet the true desires of the people that live in them, or do they create isolation in vertical, vertically gated communities? They generate significant municipal revenues and levies and many contributions to taxations that city now depend on. Because they're massive undertakings, risk and in consequence quality, difference, diversity and innovation is typically avoided. Next. The 432 Park Avenue Tower shows the endless thirst for new heights and global investment opportunities. A unit price of up to $100 million as a second or third home, it will sit largely unused for most of the years. At 425 meters, it's the tallest residential tower in the world now, and it's indicative of where we are collect collectively heading. Next slide. So, what is the issue with towers? The problem of the tower is that it's following a singular up vector. In combination with the horizontal vector of sprawl created by the car or for the car, um, we have lost our imagination for a city that is truly spatial. Next. 
Vancouver has been shaped by a history of taller buildings from the Vancouver Hotel to the West End, uh, the, the West End mid rises to the Shangri La, now uh, at 200 meters today, shown here with the Trump Tower in Toronto and the 432 Park Avenue in New York. Perhaps so have we lost our imagination for other type of buildings with the exception of few like maybe the Olympic Village? Instead, can we provide mid-rise transitional density from 50 to 50 meters or 4 to 15 stories in order to create a more consistent urban fabric? Instead, we're focusing on building more towers that are higher and taller and that connect simply urban transit points with each other while we're not questioning the possibility of what could be in between. And while we're doing this next, we're facing three major challenges today. One is simply change, an unprecedented pace of change that we're having today. And if you consider for a moment that 25 years ago we didn't have the internet, 10 years ago we didn't have smartphones, but buildings are supposed to last 50 and 100 years, how do we actually anticipate this? And are, are towers appropriate forms to, to work with this process of change? Next. Um, not only is the world uh, a, a changing place, from a change in technology perspective, but also from the urbanization next. So, two, mil two million people in Vancouver by 2050, potentially, meaning building downtown Vancouver in the lower mainland 16 times, or one of them every two years. Um, next, while we're dealing with the issues of global warming and uh, trying to come up with new sustainable opportunities, um, so are there not other possibilities <coughs> next? to create vibrant transitional communities that connect. Next one, where we, we become inventive with typologies about mid-rise overall. Next. And we have history for this. Over 50 years ago in Montreal Habitat. Next. Um, around the world, like examples like building uh, housing around a, a public market. Next. Housing associated with uh, public uh, pathways. Next one. Housing associated with the idea of community forming um, next one, housing associated with the idea of, uh, again, public pathway, in fact, threaded through a building so that it doesn't feel like a high rise if it's connected. Next one, um, similar ideas here. Even though some of you may think it's a high rise, I don't consider this actually a new kind of mineral. Uh, next one, um, ideas of uh, terracing and, and urban livability. Next one, and ideas of ultimately turning the tower apart and start stacking it in imaginative new ways. Next one, um, and yes, the Sancho Barcelona has proven itself for 150 years to be a powerful tool, next one, to shape the idea of, of, of public um, spaces that can be accessed within the buildings and where the public life is not just relegated to, uh, the, to the street space. Next one. So how do we integrate? Next. Um, by providing compatibility for diversity of homes for varying demographics and distributing demographics within buildings, difficult to do in a tower. Next, by creating a culture of innovation and build prototypes, nobody wants to be a first, but with smallest buildings, you can in fact do this. Next, by creating livability. Next, um, and indoor qualities that you normally wouldn't expect. Next by having courtyards in which you can have uh, exceptional qualities within the building, by having quiet next, by having quiet bedrooms and long materials. Um, next. Um, and ultimately, by dealing with two issues of affordability, um, platform design and, platform and, and sustainability, using systems building and prefabrication and experimentation, next. Um, Um, to provide scalability to different sites and learn from other industries and provide next adaptability to user needs um, and to different sites uh, where we can do this. Um, next, sorry, um, I have to skip and stop here. I'm running out of time and saying it's the next level of time. The city is your home. This debate is not about towers, but how we want to live. And there is a, brand range of, uh, a broad range of alternatives to towers that we're not using to confront the pressing issues that we face today. Thank you, thank you, David. Uh, good evening. We have an affordability and supply crisis in Vancouver, and we cannot afford to build fewer towers. This proposition is ridiculous, or is as ridiculous as it is dangerous. We have a strong local demand for tower homes, and to accommodate this, we must build more towers. We have a strong local business demand for central and transit-oriented office locations, 
to satisfy this and further strengthen Vancouver's economic base, we must build more towers. When and where land it is expensive, as it is now in Vancouver, it's actually freaking crazy in Vancouver right now, towers offer the greatest affordability per square foot, period. Towers are not the only solution, but building more and better towers must be part of, part of the solution. Next, please. We've been doing this for a really long time. Next. A couple thousand years ago, next. Um, back to Babylon, 2,300 years ago, we built buildings up to 300 feet high. Next. Rome, as mentioned, thank you very much to David, had 40 to 42,000 buildings of six to nine stories. And yes, the core lived to the top because it was a bitch of a lock. Um, and it was really hot up there. But we built them based on the technology we had. Next, please. As soon as the technology changed, as soon as Mr. Otis invented uh, an elevator break that actually worked, we went to the sky, we changed materials, we started building tall, and we started doing this all over the world. Next. And this is us. This is our constrained land base. We all know this, we see this all the time. We have a number of things that are sacrosanct to us. The agricultural land reserve that we have reserved since the 70s, 60,000 acres, we want to keep that generally as a society. And our metropolitan <coughs> neighborhoods, we want to keep those. We, there's not as much of an agreement, but we love those neighborhoods, they're part of our character. That leaves us very little land and very little land accessible to transit and amenities that we can build on. Next, please. Developers are opportunistic. I'm an opportunistic developer. developer. We will build anything. And we're happy just building shit. We build single family homes, and curve specials, three story houses. Next, please. Uh, we built a huge number of buildings this, in this wonderful little neighborhood that is now one of the most successful neighborhoods and neighborhoods uh, in the world. It's a bunch of towers and it's very successful. Next, please. We also will build this, given the opportunity. This could be our ALR if we wanted it to be, but thank goodness we have restrictions around going that way. Next, please. We also built transportation infrastructure, infrastructure roads, transit, etc., to get to our neighborhoods. We built this to access the North Shore in the 30s. Next, please. And a few successful buildings are very iconic buildings that were built in the early times of Vancouver and celebrated for their height, celebrated for being the tallest in the British Empire at various points. Next, please. And we built some crappy stuff. Um, concrete towers, not always my favorite. Some good examples of bad examples here in this one in Toronto. Next, please. But then other buildings that define neighborhoods and have been built well have defined open space uh, in, in our downtown core, have defined both business centers in our downtown core and in other cities in, in Vancouver. Next, please. And some good examples here of uh, mid rise office, residential and high rise office, and uh, residential mixed. Next, please. This one I'd like to speak about. I have a little bit of experience, I have a lot of gray hair because of this. This is a local success story. This building was designed. Next, please with locals in mind, the sweet size, the sweet mix, and this big ass amenity, 23,000 square foot backyard with a challenge to our landscape architects to design for integration, for engagement. This was designed such that so the people had to bump into each other, had to have, as you both dueling barbecues so they would talk to each other. And people love this. Next slide, please. And Vancouverites bought this. Vancouverites wanted a tower. The colored areas here are where over almost 60% of the purchasers currently live. This was bought by the neighborhood. This is, it was this sort of approved by the neighborhood, that's another story, but it was bought by the neighborhood. And 93% of the people and the purchasers came from Metro Vancouver. A huge Vancouver success story. Right next to this. Other art amenities, a million dollar art piece in a Burnaby uh, building that's contributing $16.5 million in CAC to the city of Burnaby. Next, please. Uh, Brentwood Center, fantastic success on transit, indoor and outdoor amenities, hugely popular, largely because of the amenity space and the towers. Next, please. These are people I know. This is my anecdotal experience of I'm living in an isolated tower. I talk to a lot of people in the tower I live in, more so, uh, I have to admit, than I did in the three single family homes that I've owned in various parts of North America. I found this community, and maybe just my dog, <laughs> but I find this community really engaging. The dog certainly helps. Next, please. And this, this is an important point on affordability. When land is very expensive, we have no choice but to go up. If we stay low, properties are more expensive. The example on, on the left is a 21 story building. The difference between the exact same suites on the third floor and the 19th floor is $177. The right hand example in Burnaby, it's $117,000 between the sixth and the 39th floor. 
This is in effect showing that the upper floors, those who pay for the views, subsidize the homes on those in the lower down the building. This is the reverse of Roman times. This is the wealthy subsidizing those who can't afford to buy at that price point. Next, please. This is where we're going. We're beyond the glass tower. The energy codes have left us to a lower light glazing ratio. We're seeing the high 40s to 50% glazing ratio as we push to push more efficient buildings. We're getting demands for more uh, common space, more amenity space, more amenity space for families and family friendly and storage. Lots more storage. Next, please. And we're hiring some fantastic local and international architects to bring design to Vancouver. We're going to be on the glass tower. Next, please. Next, please. And we're seeing this worldwide. Uh, again, Rotterdam, the land bringing the outside in. Next, please. Uh, Ward Wing building in Sydney. Next, please. And the HLA's complex that was also brought up. This one of the awards for the best. One of the awards is the best being high rise, primarily because it uses protected kids' play space on multiple levels through the building. It was designed specifically for families and answered the challenge of how families live in high rise. Next, please. Well, then, dealing with 200 tower proposals in the next couple of years. Next, please. Paris, same thing. Next, please. Next, please. Amsterdam, same thing. Next, please. And some beautiful buildings. Next, please. More beautiful buildings. Next, please. And our beautiful buildings. This is our beauty shop. This is what we sell to the world. Towers and mountains. This is Vancouver. In summary, we have an affordability and supply crisis in Vancouver. We cannot afford to build fewer towers. We have strong local demand for people to live in towers. We have near amenities in transit. We must build more towers. Thank you. The case that our opponents have made for the high rise tower this evening, but frankly, and with all due respect, I believe that their arguments are self serving and unconvincing. I'd like to suggest to you, though, that the questions before us tonight are really quite simple. What kind of a city do we want Vancouver to be? How do we want to live? What kind of housing will best prepare us for the future shocks that we will face? And what forms of housing are more equitable for us all as we build a better Vancouver? I know what my answer is. And we also know how, many, how so many other cities have answered these questions with a much wider range of housing types and far less reliance on a single high-rise tower solution. So why should we continue to build so much inflexible, unadaptable high-rise tower housing? I often compare Vancouver's towers to London's row houses. For example, I graduated from the Architectural Association, which is housed in a row house development around Bedford Square. Originally built as a single family house, it then became divided into flats, became a publishing house, turned into a school of architecture, which now incorporates a library, a bar, a gallery, a bookshop, a cafeteria. You get the point. And the entire square is like that. And it includes housing, by the way. You can't do that with towers. Also, one of the reasons that we don't have more diverse housing in Vancouver, I think, is that the city itself has more very restrictive zoning and building codes, which makes it very difficult. And we do need to create simpler, more effective zoning regulations that encourage a much wider range of housing types. I believe that it's high time we offered residents a far wider range of housing types and tenure. Our opponents will have you believe that yet more high-rise towers is the answer. Don't believe it for a moment. For all the reasons that my colleagues and I have outlined tonight, the era of the residential high-rise towers dominance in Vancouver must end and end soon. I trust you will agree with us. Thank you. Thank you, Lance. Dave Ramsey, you have two minutes. Um, what I would have kept on going had I had 48 seconds instead of 42 seconds is that our biggest urban design disasters in this region have happened at the mid-rise level. Our biggest urban design and livability triumphs in this region have most often happened in our highest density neighborhoods, right? Where we have been actually using high-rise towers to create a livable fabric out of what was previously unliverable, crime-ridden, unsafe. So, you know, I'm not saying that we don't have to have a diversity of housing types. I would embrace a diversity of housing types. But I think that we have to realize that we should build more towers because we, we're just going to need it to accommodate the growth. And we shouldn't be afraid of it and we shouldn't fight it. We should be focusing our energies on how to make those towers better, more humane, more well, uh, more livable. How do they create more social inclusion and more community connection? 
it's difficult to argue against our colleagues here because they're arguing for something that doesn't currently exist in Vancouver and it seems utopian and bucolic and well designed. And I would love to have that too, but we can't pretend that that's going to could totally offset the need for towers in the future. It's absolutely part of our future, and I hope it is, but it's not going to allow us to build less towers. And, you know, I think the, the final comment I would make here, too, is that we also have to get over our ideas of putting towers with towers, and mid-rise with mid-rise, and, and low-rise with low-rise. When you look at the, the success of the West End, it's a hodgepodge of different housing types that seem to work better in a mature neighborhood that you know creates a lot more uh, vibrancy and community feel than something that you know is just a, a endless row houses, which you know can also uh, you know in the, in the early '60s in, in, in England were had their issues with livability and uh, generation. So, thank you. We live in a world of change with significant challenges to global warming and increasing affordability prices in almost all cities that have become attractors like Vancouver. Towers have been the go-to solution in the world of global capital flow, marketing and investment, but they've failed to provide sustained solutions to the ever-growing pace of urbanization. Instead, they've increasingly distanced people from the opportunity to invent their own communities and for collaborative interactions. Towers are part of our affordability crisis today. A risk-averse formulaic approach has resulted in an endless one fits all approach that seemingly works for investors but few else. The intelligence and creativeness of professional building communities has largely vanished as to be subservient to pre-formulated visions of so-called market experts and the utter concern of our regulators about their political capital and the loud voices of few. Instead, we are at a moment of incredible opportunity to create new forms of housing built to high new standards and combining and finding ways to combine affordability, livability, and sustainability as an integrated solution for people and communities while creating vibrant new industries that will have global relevance in the field of design, engineering, fabrication, and the wood industry that is local to us. Mid-rise building will provide us with these opportunities. The issue is not just to build less towers, but to collaborate more, to define a new regulatory framework and new processes that are defined from the inside out from people and issues, from technology and opportunity, from a better future, not just short-term concerns of capital, be that political or monetary. So let's build the best towers. Oliver, thank you. Now, Christopher Ballin, you have the last word for two minutes. Sweet. <coughs> Excuse me. Mid-rise are great, but we have an affordability and supply crisis in Vancouver, and we cannot afford build fewer towers. Build fewer towers means more suburban business parks, which are environmentally unsustainable. It means more pressure on our and encroachments on our agricultural land, and it means more cost pressure on our mid and low rise homes. It means more people commuting on our already clogged roads, and it means a less sustainable and less affordable region. It also means less open space, in just period, less open space. Build fewer towers is untenable and unacceptable to current and future generations of Vancouverites. We're growing as a region, and we are um, underbuilding to accommodate this growth. We have a crisis of affordability in large part because we are not providing enough homes for Vancouverites and enough business space for Vancouverites. We want to encourage businesses to locate near our urban cores in transit. Even if you hate the very concept of towers, you have to consider that more towers for businesses instead of sprawling business parks in the suburbs is the best solution. So we absolutely need more towers for businesses to encourage the thriving and Vancouver economy. On the residential side, when people have a choice, many choose to live in and thrive in their homes and communities within towers, and they thrive living in towers within their communities. I'll repeat that. We thrive and are engaged in towers within our communities. Even if you personally would never choose to live in a tower, you must consider that we as a community should provide a variety of, a variety of housing types, including towers with great amenities to Vancouver's you want. This demand is a, is a reality right now, and to satisfy this existing demand, we need more towers. We have seen this in many local tower projects with individuals, young couples, families, and seniors lining up to purchase their home. Towers are not meant for everyone, nor for every place, but they absolutely and unquestionably have a critical future role to play in housing, Vancouver rights, and Vancouver businesses. Thank you.
<laughs> so the last time, pro was 95 with 51%. Con was 91 with 49%. This time, pro is 94 <laughs> with 48%. And con is 100, with uh, which puts them at 52%. So con actually won being more persuasive. <laughs> Hello, Mr. Ballen. We are from CNTVNA.com, so we just have several short questions. So um, the first question is, how's your feeling of winning the debate tonight? Uh, it's wonderful. I think, I think the win was the conversation and the fact that we had an engaging conversation. We won by a margin of a couple of points, which is satisfying. And could you just briefly introduce yourself? Uh, my name is Chris Fallen. I, I'm the VP of Development for Rise Alliance, uh, which is a medium, small size development firm here in Vancouver that's been practicing uh, mainly urban f infill for about 22 years in Vancouver. And tonight we talk a lot about the density here in Vancouver, but compared to a lot of mega cities existing in the world, like a lot of cities in China, Vancouver is still like relatively tiny. So how do the other mega cities with like high rise buildings actually inspire uh, Vancouver's um, landscape and inspire your business? I think we're learning and have learned from a lot of other cities around the world, both from Europe, from Asia, on how to do things well, but also how not to do things well. And we've invented, I think in the last 30 years, what we call Vancouverism, which is a, a call it a, a gentler form of urbanizing that makes it more livable, allowing for space between buildings, allowing for, allowing for amenity space on the ground floor. And I think we've done that very successfully. And it's, it's a fairly unique adaption to, to Vancouver that has then been exported to other areas and is, and is successful in other other countries and in terms of the identity and uh, the localization and how do you situate Vancouver in the globalization um, process in terms of like the more immigrants here and uh, the landscape changing we're, we're still a very small city but we're a very popular city and we have a fantastic mix of, of immigrants both young and, and have, who have been here for a long time that gives us a very interesting dynamic. We're the most Asian city in North America. In fact, I believe we're the most Asian city outside of Asia itself, which gives us a very unique opportunity and culture. And I think we, we work with that. I think it becomes part of our politics and part of our overall culture. So although we're small and we're very young, we have a very strong connection to the rest of the world. Oh, I thought it was an excellent debate. I think it's a very important issue to be discussed. Um, I'm thrilled we get that many votes because we are not representing what the establishment is currently doing. We're doing a lot of towers right now and we're arguing to come up with alternative forms of housing, of forms of urban development. And, and those are needed almost anywhere in the world these days because I think the models that we have um, currently have failed us in many ways. They don't meet our sustainability goals any longer, our affordability issues and so forth. But we need to build them up. And so they, they bring up issues, they bring up questions about our regulatory framework, about the way our industries work, about the way, about what kind of products we deliver, and how we want to live in the future. And so I think sometimes it's easier to, to hang on to what we currently have and go with it a little longer, even though we realize both here and abroad and many places in the world, the, the, the ideas of how we've been building cities will not be sufficient to sustain this growth and these kind of global challenges that we're facing. So given the fact Vancouver is a diverse city and maybe more than one-fifth of the population come from China, we also from people uh, move from like um, Iran and uh, India, all those people are actually having experiences living in mega cities with high buildings, so high-rise buildings. So how, how these things weigh your uh, conceptualization of Vancouver's um, coming future? Well, the, the, one of the beautiful things about Vancouver is that it is so multicultural. So we're thinking, and in our models that we've developed, is work it so that people can find their way of living. If they're multi-generational, or if they individual but live by themselves, they have families, they change their lifestyle over time, there needs to be some recognition for that, that people can find their homes instead of just you buying into a developer's dream, right, or a developer's marketing illusion. So having the possibility to use our latest technology. We customize our smart homes, right? Any product you buy right now, you, you expect to have an individual experience 
with it that you can find the kind of product that you like, right? Because it's ultimately, it's about you. And the products that we're giving by building just high rises is the same formulaic repetition of the same. We're basically buying an investment, but we don't buy homes.